I am going to introduce Mr. Wes McKinney, who is going to give our first, uh, Wes, maybe you can come up and uh, set up your laptop. Uh, he's going to give our first keynote speech here in PyCon APAC 2014. And uh, I suppose that every one of us has known that Wes is the author of, Pi uh, of Pandas, which is the most important tool for data science with, by using Python. And uh, it's really our pleasure um, to see Wes today. Sorry, I'm competing with him a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah. So today he, he's going to talk about his, his experience and his, uh, his um, insights about data, data science and uh, all his learning in the Python technology. So, 1024? Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, 1024. That's the best resolution. So, after a little bit of waiting for the talk, we are all set and let us welcome Wes McKinney. Well, thank you, uh, thank you everyone for uh, for inviting me to the conference. I uh, it's my my second um, second keynote talk in the uh, Asia Pacific region. I, I was the uh, I was a uh, speaker at uh, PyCon Singapore last year, so I'm very very happy to be back. And thank you very much for thank you very much for having me. Um, so I uh, I work on I work on data tools, and um, so this talk is is about. Uh, is about data tools, especially for for business use cases, and um, so you know we'll kind of go from here. Uh, many of you, many of you know me. I um, I started the the pandas project about six years ago. It was uh, I, I started building it. And initially, it was a personal toolkit for just to make working with data a little bit less painful for myself. I was working in the uh, in the finance industry for for a hedge fund just outside of. New York City, and uh, I found that you know between writing R code and SQL and working with Excel, that I was going a little bit crazy. And uh, so Pandas was was born out of um, just wanting to make myself a little uh, more sane, a little more productive, um, and it sort of has grown into a, a large project uh, at at this point. Um, so I um, I wrote a book. I don't know how many of you um, own a copy of. Uh, own a copy of the book. I have I have several. Um, so I'm very excited that it's it's sold very well. It's been very popular uh, all you know all around all around the world. And just in the last several months, I got the first uh, translations. So the first translations that of the book that I got were all um, into into Asian languages. So I have uh, on my shelf at home um, the Chinese and Korean and, and Japanese versions of the book. I, I think the uh, uh, the translator of the Korean version is even here today, so um, so very excited and gives me um, it makes me very happy that, that everyone in this part of the world is also very interested and excited about uh, about data tools. Uh, I started a company um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, we we're we're located in in San Francisco. We are working on on analytics tools, a bit less intended for for Python programmers and more more. To, um, Designing as a visual interface that does not have code for for business analysts, and we're we're launching the company very soon. So if you're interested in um, visual data analysis tools, then you might find what we're building interesting. And if I have if I have enough time uh, in the talk, I will I will show some of those uh, what we're building. So the the things that I, I wanted to talk about in the talk. So first of all. Um, you know why are why are, you know what are people using Python for when it comes to to analytics? Uh, and I'll, I've got to define what do I mean by analytics. Um, it's kind of a it's a sub segment of data analysis more generally. Of course, people have been using Python for data analysis since the mid 1990s, but uh, Python's use for 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 analytics is a bit more recent. Um, there's a bit of history how we even got here in the first place. And the the reasons that Python has become popular for doing for doing analytics, and talk a little bit about uh, the future and maybe um, what I see happening, or um, you know what are the opportunities and and challenges for for Python programmers who work work with data uh, going forward. 
So I wanted to define a few concepts just to get us kind of in the same, um, in the same you know, ballpark. Um, so we're talking about the same things. So the, the spaces where I, I spend a lot of my time, um, the first is business intelligence. So if you've, if you've never heard of business intelligence, um, probably a good thing, actually. Uh, if you have heard of business intelligence, I'm sorry. Uh, many business intelligence tools are not very good and uh, cause a lot of pain and suffering for, for their users. Um, this definition came from, sort of paraphrased from, from Wikipedia. Uh, it's a bit dry. Uh, so methods for turning raw data into actionable information for business purposes, um, which is you know very similar and hard to tell apart from what's often known as business analytics. Um, which is more around um, sort of the exploration and investigation of, of past, um, you know, of business data, um, more oriented toward, toward getting insights and to help sort of forecast and plan, um, plan for the business ahead. Um, so the way that I would describe these, these two areas of, of technology in a bit more concrete terms, because if you, if you look at websites about business intelligence or about analytics, it's very, very hard to tell them apart. I, I often, I really struggle with it myself. So I would, I would say that they fall into, into these buckets, namely that business intelligence is more about um, querying databases and data stores. It's about building reports. So the reports might be pivot tables or visualizations or you know, subsets of in, you know, information extracted by querying the data stores. Um, there's another aspect which is um, creating alerts, so it might be that you want to build a report and you might look at it you know, once a day or maybe you look at it like a couple times a month, but if there's some drastic change in a, in a metric that's relevant to the business, you want it to send you an email so that you know that something requires attention, that something bad is going on. Whereas analytics is more about, um, le less about looking at how the business is doing and like what are, you know, Number of users, sales, you know, looking at you know market sales and marketing performance, and the analytics is more a lot more exploratory. There's more statistics. Um, there's a lot more science involved uh, with, with analyzing the data. The analysis itself may not be very complex. It might simply involve um, something that you could do with with pandas or you could do with R that doesn't even require any statistics at all and is just um, glorified counting. So a lot of analytics is just counting at the end of the day. Um, there's another uh, big area of work that is closely, closely related to, to both um, BI and, and analytics, which is, um, which is called, commonly called ETL. And if you've never heard the term ETL, it stands for extract, transform, and load. And it turns out that um, a, lot of, a lot of people are using Python for ETL and they don't know it. So anytime that you've read a CSV file and loaded it into a database or queried a database and outputted it to a CSV file, you have unknowingly done ETL. Um, it might be that the, the story is a lot more complex. You have you know, RESTful APIs and various you know, data living in many different places. And so if you're doing uh, if you're doing analytics, you may have to do ETL before you can even begin to answer the questions. Um, so joining together multiple sources, um, changing the structure of data to be more amenable for, for doing analytics uh, is all part of the, the ETL process. Um, there's also data cleaning involved. So if you've ever dealt with a lot of CSV files, you've inevitably run into data cleanliness and data quality issues um, that are you know, part of the workflow. And that's often where a lot of the time the time is spent. So the, re the reason I wanted to make these, these definitions, and just in case you're, you know, you don't, a lot of you may not do any, any data work at all, but uh, the last three years have been really transformative for, uh, for, for the analytics space and, and because, because Python has become a lot more popular. So if you went back to, to 2010, 2008, 2009, um, when I was getting started doing, working with data in Python, um, doing analytics in Python made you look really weird. People would ask you, you know, why are you, why are you using Python for that? People don't, people don't use Python for that. Um, it appeared risky. Uh, there were very few resources. It was hard to learn how, how to work with data in, in Python. Um, there's many reasons why it was, why, why, you know, 
it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. In order to make people feel comfortable doing, um, doing more analytics, more data analysis in Python, they needed to see that there were a lot of people doing, doing data analysis in Python. So speak a bit about maybe why this has happened um, and what it means for the next, the next few years. So there, there's many, there's many um, parts to the, um, parts of the story, like how, how, how Python became useful for, for doing analytics. So the first, the first reason I, I would say is that the entire ecosystem has become a great deal more mature. Um, so NumPy, which is the um, array, array, sort of the, the lowest level piece of data processing um, in Python, NumPy only really became um, a thing that everybody used around 2005 or 2006. So if you go back in time, in the late 1990s, there were two numerical ar array libraries for Python. There was NumArray and Numeric, and it created fragmentation in the community. And as a result, you know, you had libraries, some of which depended on Numeric, some of which depended on NumArray, and it made for, you know, a very confusing and difficult experience for anyone um, doing a lot of, you know, data processing um, in Python. Another problem, of course, is, is, is packaging uh, and being able to actually get the, all of the tools that you need to be productive up and running on your machine. Um, it might just, and the packaging problem affects users as individuals who are learning how to, how to use the tools. So it might be, you know, you've never used Python before, or maybe you have Python just the interpreter installed, and you want to start working with data, and then it becomes, well, I need to install NumPy and SciPy and Matplotlib and IPython, and you kind of go down the list of all of the dependencies, and you start pip installing, or maybe back in those days you would easy install uh, all, the, all of those things. And, you know, if any one of those packages had a 5 to 10 percent chance of failure of installing, you know, you've got, you've got 10 dependencies, and the chance that the whole thing is going to fail is, you know, it's about one. So, you know, people would start programming in Python, and they would, they would get about four or five dependencies in to getting everything set up, and then they would hit a wall, and then they would find that, you know, on Stack Overflow, no one really can tell them, like, how to fix it, and digging around, you know, mailing list posts on, you know, Google Groups, and, uh, and trying to find out, and then people just give up. And so many people, you know, if you think about like the conversion rate for, for Python, getting people to, 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 do, to do data stuff, um, people would just, you know, they would start like, well, maybe I should use Python for this, and then they would start and just getting the environment set up, they would bounce, and they would never come back. And then they would, they would use R because R has a much more pleasant packaging and installation experience. Same is true of if you build software that is mission critical for your business, being able to take the software and deploy it on servers, you have to, you have to solve the packaging problem again. So I know I'm preaching to the choir, but, um, you know, five, six years ago, seven years ago, it was, you know, it was a showstopper for most businesses being able to, to choose Python, just being able to deploy and get it installed everywhere where it was needed. Um, certainly, the developer tools, uh, you know, the um, growth of IPython as a development environment is a, is a big hook for getting people uh, to, to use Python because of the exploratory nature of the, of the environment, being able to quickly try a lot of things. Um, it, mentally, like, the, you know, how, how much work it feels like to you know, open up an IPython session, grab some data, to play with it, to, you know, to ask a few questions and get some answers. You know, seeing, viewing that as a low-cost thing and, and that the tools support you during this process, especially when you're sort of iteratively trying lots and lots of different things. All of those small details about, you know, command history and autocomplete um, and just being able to interactively work with data is, is a big part of enabling, um, enabling people to be productive because the, the analytics process is very exploratory in nature. Um, so the last thing, of course, is that it's, it's been much easier for people to learn, to learn these tools, um, especially with the IPython notebook. I, I don't know how many of you in the room have been to NB Viewer um, before. So there's this, uh, if, you, if you look at, if, you, if you've used the IPython notebook before, which I'm sure you'll hear about from Fernando during his keynote, um, 
NB Viewer is a site that enables users to publish their IPython notebooks. Um, and it has been one of the main ways that, that people have, have been publishing and disseminating um, data analysis work in Python. And it's been such a huge thing because it removes the barrier of having to take analysis from a Python script, take all of the plots, take all of the results, and then format them in HTML so that they can be published, um, pub published on the web. And it's really made, you know, I think made all the difference in um, communicating about, about um, data analysis and statistics um, in Python. And certainly, you know, books help. So being able to grab a book and learn the whole stack is a nice thing. Um, of course, there's, there's, alternatives to, um, there's alternatives to Python. Um, the one I didn't mention up here is, is SQL, of course. Um, a lot of data analysis and analytics takes place in, in SQL. But if you're using a programming language, um, you know, years ago, honestly, your best bet was R. And if you were in a company that had SAS or Stata or another um, proprietary, um, proprietary programming language, you might use that. But the open source alternative, you know, going back to 2007, you know, conventional, the conventional wisdom was just use R. Um, so another thing that is very exciting is that um, in the, um, unfortunately only in the Western Hemisphere, um, I would love to see some, some PyData conferences get um, organized in the, um, in the Asia Pacific region. Um, but just, just only two years ago, we started having, we had the very first PyData meetup. I wouldn't even call it a conference. It was really uh, 40, 50 people huddled together in a, um, in a small conference room, you know, that held 50 people at Google. And we were over, you know, there weren't enough seats for everybody. Um, but we wanted to get everyone together and, and start having meeting, meetups and to talk about data tools for Python. Um, and through, through the, you know, um, huge efforts of, um, of Continuum Analytics, who are also responsible for, for Anaconda, if any of you use Anaconda, uh, Python distribution. Um, they've helped grow the conference to the current, you know, very large size. Uh, the just, just held um, PyData 2014 in Silicon Valley was at, was at Facebook. And so Facebook was um, just so excited to host us and to have the conference. At, and uh, they, you know, essentially smoothed over everything and provided food and um, so to have like a big tech company in Silicon Valley uh, sort of falling over themselves to host a Python data conference was really, uh, really a milestone for, for the community and to have 500 people, 500 people show up um, from all around the world. So uh, a little bit about, about Pandas and why, why, why Pandas succeeded at all. Um, it's a question that I've, I've asked myself uh, a number of times, and I, I tried to find some answers to, you know, w what it took to gain critical mass and um, for people to start using it and using it seriously. Um, so there's a couple of things. So uh, I would say that the the, the approach that, that that I took and that you know, as I had started having a lot more developers in the, it's now a very large developer development team. You know, I think there's been 200 250 contributors. Uh, to the project, but um, part of what I, what I wanted to build into the culture of, of, of Pandas was um, is consistency, and um, especially when you know you're adding a new API, and if you've used Pandas, you you, you probably know that the API is really really large. Uh, there's hundreds there's hundreds of methods, um, which is different from a library that might have five API functions or ten API functions. Um, the, the best example that I can think of a, of a simple a a library with a simple API is requests, which has, you know, request.get, request.put. Um, of, of course, there's a lot more to it than that, but, you know, you're talking about, an, you know, a very, very small API. Um, whereas with Pandas, you have multiple data structures. You have each of those data structures has dozens or maybe at this point, a data frame has over over a hundred instance methods, um, and if you if you don't enforce very strong consistency in parameter names, in the return types, essentially the semantics of how all of those API functions work, it makes the whole library very confusing to use. And if you want to enable people to chain together 
chain together methods and reason about the data, and especially the data that hasn't been computed yet, um, you have to be very, very consistent and to enforce um, so that when you go reach for another method in the library that you don't have to go and dig and read the documentation um, to, to, you know, to understand like, well, these are the, you know, I don't know what the parameters are for this, this method and there's a thousand methods that you have to memorize the parameters. Um, the, um, the user base has also been, um, I, th I think some of the early users and developers of Pandas are very, very passionate about, um, about the library and, and growing the community. So having, um, so if you, you know, if you set out to, to build an open source, an open source project, uh, it's, I would say it's impossible to do alone. You have to have, you have to, you have to find or you may either enlist directly evangelists to help you um, grow the community. So what, so what is growing the community? For open source, um, most of growing the community is um, that people feel like there's somebody there to answer their questions. Uh, and this is the biggest problem with open source is that somebody picks up a library, it's open source, they say, oh well, I, I don't have to pay for it, so step one. Uh, I have the library, and then they start using it, and pretty soon they run into a lack of documentation, they need help, and they're going to go to Stack Overflow, or they're going to go to a mailing list, and if they ask questions and there's no one there to help them, then they might decide after a period of frustration that, that you know, well, screw that tool, and, they, and then they never, they never come back. So in the case of Pandas, I was lucky to have some very passionate um, early adopters who um, helped me answer all of the questions on, on Stack Overflow. So there's a fellow named um, Andy Hayden, I think has answered you know, four, or 500, four or 500 or more questions on Stack Overflow. Um, and the same with Jeff, uh, this fellow named Jeff, Jeff Reback, who is now the lead developer um, on the project, since I'm a bit uh, less involved um, lately. So another thing about Pandas that I, I don't want to discount is that um, because um, I think that it would have been very difficult to develop Pandas without having IPython as part of the whole part of the process. So because I wanted to be able to work with data interactively in IPython, it shaped the, the API of the library to be easy to use interactively in, in IPython. And I think that is a, is a huge strength of, of, any, um, of any data library that it is not unpleasant to use interactively. Um, and I would, I would encourage you if you build um, any, any kind of analytical toolkit or statistics library that you, you, if you don't heavily use IPython, that at least you think about all of the, the people who are using IPython and how the experience of working with those tools um, how that will feel while you're in an IPython notebook, while you're in an IPython terminal, and you know you sit down with a colleague and you're looking at something and you're quickly kind of iterating through uh, a number of different uh, a number of different ideas. Um, and when I use a library in IPython that hasn't been designed with that in mind, um, you feel the you know you can feel the clumsiness. It's like well, I've got to just break out the text editor and you know hack for a while, and then maybe I'll come and paste it back into. IPython when I'm done. Um, the story is certainly more, more complex than that for um, you know, the success of Pandas. Uh, of course, you know, these were the other tools that, that I had helping me along the way. Um, just Cython by itself as a tool to, to make writing fast code a, a, a lot easier in Python. Uh, as pure Python, of, of course, you're doing, you're doing data analytics, you might have a very, very large table of data, millions of rows. Uh, doing all of that data processing in pure Python would just be too slow for, for, a, lot of, for a lot of things. Um, so that, before there was Cython, that left writing, well, there was Pyrex, but that's a whole other story. But before there was Cython and before there was Pyrex, your only solution was to write C code, which is a lot more it takes a lot more time to write C code. You have to learn the Python C API. It's just a lot more time consuming. And at the time when I started writing Pandas, I was not a very good C programmer. I did not have time to learn the Python C API. I did look at the Python C API and it terrified me. Um, which is, and it's funny in retrospect because I use it a lot now and I find it quite pleasant. Um, but you know, the optics when you've never used a big C API before, is, it's 
um, quite off-putting. And Cython makes that, makes that process a lot more pleasant. Um, of course, you know, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, the core of, you know, the foundation of the scientific stack, you know, 10 years of work by, you know, Travis Oliphant and John Hunter and kind of all the people involved in sort of building out and making those, those libraries um, ready, for, ready for production. Um, you know, I wouldn't have been able to get off the ground had it not been for that. Honestly, the, the biggest thing that, you know, led to the initial prototype of Pandas was um, the, the library that, that gave birth to stats models, which is the statistics library for, for Python. Um, there's a, a professor at uh, Stanford, Stanford University, Jonathan Taylor, who had, um, in, I think out of his own frustration with R, had implemented a number of statistical models in Python, and they were some of the most basic regression models, um, and th it happened to be that those were the exact tools that I needed for my R project, and so I was like, well, the results match between R and, you know, this Stanford professor's Python code, so let me just try doing this whole project in Python, and, uh, you know, it just kind of all got out of hand after, after that. So in, in general, I, I, I find that um, my approach to, um, to, building, to building data software is, is to look at, um, there's, there's two sides of the coin. So there's, you know, there's the underlying, you know, how, do you, how do you implement it? How do you make it fast? How do you make it work on a lot of data without your machine running out of RAM? So that's like the implementation, like algorithms, Side of, side of the problem. And you have to do a really good job of that, otherwise you start using the tool for real world, real world problems and you hit a wall because it hasn't been designed with, you know, um, you know, doing data analysis on large data sets that are at the limit of what your machine can handle from a RAM, RAM point of view. Um, a bigger part of the problem for me is, is, is the user interface side of things and often that if you're not experiencing the problem yourself, you have to go out and, t and reach the people who are having the problems and understanding their, their workflows. And, you know, and sometimes people will have very inefficient workflows and be spending a lot of time you know, doing some kind of data wrangling or you, know, you sit with them and you see their code and you say, well, you know, what are you doing here? And they say, well, this is just this thing that I have to do to get from point A to point B. And you say, well, why do you do that? And it's like, well, I don't know. That's just what we have to do. And, and I think in, in, in all software and especially in tools, if you find that the, those, those things that people are doing that they don't realize are dragging them down and making them less productive, those are the, the real opportunities to make things, to make thing, things better. Of course, you have to come up with something better. And that's, that can be hard as well. So you might find a problem and find no good solutions. Um, so when it comes to Pandas, I, I, the, the big things have been, um, and this is a time of, you know, the second part of the story, like how Pandas became successful is making the easy stuff really, really easy. Um, so honestly, just being able to have a CSV file and to get that CSV file into Python with one line of code and be able to, in 80, 90 percent of cases, able to get some simple statistic, like some simple statistics or answers about that data, um, to be able to do that in just a few lines of code, that's honestly, you know, um, that's that's the biggest thing that gets people hooked on hooked on the tools. Um, same is true when people learn Python. You say, well, I want to just read some data from a file and, you know, maybe, you know, strip some white space from each line. You say, well, you know, four line in open file path. And they're like, well, it's that easy? And you say, yeah, it's that easy. And that's honestly a lot of what pe gets Python programmers started in the first place because of that kind of the drug of, wow, it's just, it's just really easy and, uh, and it's uh, not a lot of code. Um, of course, when it comes to you know C just even CSV files, it, it's a an unfortunately a more complex story than you know getting a file pointer and handing it to CSV um, dot reader, um, and that's this is where kind of the drudgery that, that a library like Pandas, um, so a lot of the value comes from what's happening under the hood, and it's and you know and that takes months and months of 
unit testing and finding all of the, the weird cases that, you know, that, um, that would, you know, somebody would read a file and then be unable to move forward because there's some problem that they have to deal with. Many of those things are um, inferring the right types for columns, um, dealing with missing data, um, and just simple things like, you know, you have a five million row table and you don't want to wait an hour for it to load. Preferably a minute would be, would be preferable. So I was very excited. I was, I was actually at, at PyData uh, Silicon Valley and um, somebody who I will not name but exclaimed that, you know, I had saved them from R and it was a big, it was a big tech company in uh, Silicon Valley. So was, this, this sort of thing makes me really happy to hear. Uh, I, I would say this is a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, <laughs> um, so another thing that I, I, I talk a lot about and care a lot about is, um, especially because big data is such a, a buzzword these days, that um, a lot of the interesting data analysis problems are not um, are not big data problems. They're actually um, small data, or as I like to say, medium data problems. Um, and this is where the, the tool making really makes a big impact in your ability to, to get things done. Um, because very sort of poorly thought out data tools uh, will struggle once you get to, I'm working with a gigabyte of data or even 100 megabytes, you know, 100 megabytes can be a problem if the tools haven't been, haven't been designed right. Um, and I think this has been Python's sweet spot has been um, to be the ultimate medium data, medium data tool. So if you have a gigabyte of data, um, it's the, that's the, the scale of data where Python is the ideal, the ideal tool. Um, it's another very popular tweet uh, that, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of data, a lot of data analysis is spent um, cleaning data. Um, a lot of time spent complaining about, complaining about cleaning data. And, and people often describe, um, Pandas as a data science as a data science library, but it's actually the, the science happens outside of pandas. That pandas is really helps you get ready for the science, and it turns out that's where a lot of the time uh, a lot of the time is spent. Um, so I heard this quote recently, and, and this is another part of it might be a bit controversial. So, you know, I, I like Python a lot. Um, I would like to know who said this. Maybe somebody will, somebody will tell me. Um, but they said that Python's the second best language for most problems. Um, this is also a big reason why companies are adopting, are adopting Python. It's because it's the one language that everybody can get on board with, even though they're all working on different things. So you might say, you have one person that says, well, we should really use Scala for this problem. And then other one, somebody else will say, well, Scala is terrible for this problem that I have, and I need to use your code. And so they get into an argument, and then they settle on Python because everybody can, everybody can use Python. Um, and I would say that this is a huge strength for the community um, that, uh, you know, Python is not the fastest language. Um, it's not the, the best language for big data. Um, it, May or may not be the best language for web development. I, I think it's I think it's pretty good for web development. But you know, you get a Ruby person and a Python person in the room, and you know, you may not agree on this. Um, but you could have, the Ruby person will at least concede that Python is the second best language after Ruby. <laughs> so you can agree to disagree. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of Python projects that I, I think are really exciting and are helping, um, helping the, the, the data cause. Um, so one is having better data visualization uh, for Python. So there's a project called um, Seaborn. So if you do statistical data visualization in Python, um, so building a, um, a rich data, uh, sort of data tool, uh, sort of visualization tool that uses matplotlib so people see Seaborn plots and they're like, I didn't know you could do that with matplotlib. And so it's sort of given people, uh, it's breathed new life into matplotlib, which many people had completely written off as incapable of making good statistical visualizations and um, just took one person to prove, prove everyone wrong. Um, another, of course, is, um, is scikit-learn, um, especially for data scientists, scikit-learn has, um, even though there's, you know, there's so much 
talk about big data and Hadoop and um, all that stuff. For most people, most people don't have big data, and they now that there is a high quality, um, easy to use machine learning toolkit um, that's developed by a huge community with a good API. Um, most people are they can install. Anaconda or Canopy, one of the Python, scientific Python distributions, and they have their data science problem and they can learn scikit-learn and they can build their recommendation engine or they can solve their data science problems in Python um, very, very quickly without having to buy enterprise software or to really invest a lot of energy. And, um, and this has been huge for, for getting people um, Scikit-learn has been, has been a big deal as well for, for getting companies to adopt Python because they can solve all of their data science and predictive, predictive analytics needs in, in Python now. Uh, so I, I will say that, um, and, I, and I've talked about this in some other talks, that um, I, I don't think that, that uh, I won't tell anyone that, that Pandas is the, the ultimate the ultimate data tool, or you know, the the, the final, you know, the final, um, the, it's like the best solution to all uh, to all data data problems. But um, that was never the point. Uh, the point was was to build a, a, a to build a project with with very broad appeal that, that can bring people together and have and build common ground around working with working with data. Um, and that was a big part of building the community. Is that you know if you had two different kinds of data people, they could at least agree to use pandas, even though they use different parts of pandas to solve their problems. Um, another thing that I, I wouldn't say it's, it's been good for, for pandas is adoption, but in, in the long term, it's, it's a liability is that uh, it stretches for compatibility with all of the rest of the scientific Python libraries, which is also a limitation in some ways. Um, that there's kind of, and if you look at the pandas code base, there's an accumulation of, of hacks. Many of them, many of them are just to get around matplotlib plotting bugs and things of that, things like that. Um, they're all they're all fixable, but uh, it's when when you're when you're go, you know when everyone comes in, I guess when people use your project and they say, well, I I used this other project and I had a problem, and then you you look and you say, well. You know that that sort of is outside of the design of this thing that I've been building, but I can make some small design concessions, and I can, or maybe I can insert some kludges or some hacks, and I can get it working, and then you get it working, and then that person is happy, and this process happens about a hundred times or a thousand times, and you know, and then it's 2014, and it's like, well, <laughs> we've been, uh, you know, making pandas the kind of as compatible as possible for years. Um, and thinking about ways to, to grow the software um, to be more future-proof, it's, it's a big source of concern, but it's also true of all, pretty much all open source pr software has this problem. Um, another thing is that, um, you know, the data is growing in size. Somebody told me that uh, a lot of users don't have big data, they have medium data over time and over time, the medium data becomes big data. So, uh, if, you know, if you have a single day, and maybe in a single day you generate one gigabyte of data, and that's, you know, plenty, of, that's, you know, plenty small for, to work with pandas, and then a year later, you're approaching a third of a terabyte, and, and then, you know, Python at the moment is not, uh, not the best solution um, if you want the same kind of um, API um, if you want to use the same code that you work with on that one gigabyte of data to work with that, you know, third of a terabyte or ten terabytes of data. So, a, a number of people have talked about Python eating, eating R's lunch, uh, so to speak. Uh, that taking, that a lot of people fr are coming from R to, going from R to Python. But I would say that there, there's a bigger trend that R is growing, Python is growing faster as a you know, second derivative, um, but a lot of the growth is coming from many people are having to work, do data, data analysis that never had to do data analysis before, 
And people are coming from proprietary tools and now finding that open source is, uh, the open source software is good enough um, to replace the tools that they used to pay for. Another thing is um, the, uh, the, Java, the Java ecosystem. And unfortunately, the uh, um, enterprise and sort of big business space is very dominated by, uh, by the Java ecosystem. Um, and that, I think, you know, is a, just a, an area of concern for, for all sort of data engineers. Um, the last thing, of course, is that, you know, process computers and processor architectures are changing. Um, we can't make the CPUs, Moore's law is slowing down. We can't make the CPUs faster, but we can put a lot more cores on, on a chip. So, so now things like how to, you know, things that people are thinking about, how to incorporate um, GPU computing into analytics and data processing, um, or how to, you know, take an algorithm that was not designed to be put on a 64-core processor, and how do we design all of our systems um, to work in a, in a very highly concurrent multi-core multi -core world. So some things that I, I think about for the, for the future, um, trends and, and things that we're going to have to, have to resolve over the next um, 10 years. Um, I, I think fundamentally, if you look at, at pandas and tools like, like pandas, the, the, the most important, one of the most important things, uh, parts of the library is, is, is the API, the code, the code that you write and the execution, how, how that code is evaluated is, you know, as I said before, is it's, it's a separate, it's a separate problem. Um, and so as the data becomes bigger and bigger, and also RAM, you know, the, the cost of RAM is going to, well, it's not going to zero, but it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. Uh, in the future, essentially all of our data will just be sitting, this is my prediction, all of our data will just be sitting um, split into chunks across clusters of machines just sitting in RAM waiting for computation to be uh, evaluated on it. Um, so we're going to have to separate how that, that execution, how, how the operations are evaluated over the data from the API. And you as the programmer, this is of course, you know, the holy kind of, the holy grail of, of data analysis is to be able to write code in a way that you don't have to think about how it's executed, that um, that all gets handled by the, by the back-end side of things. Another thing that I, I also think a lot about is how, how, um, how to keep Python competitive. Um, if, you're, if you're in um, big businesses and enterprise you know, companies with over 500 employees, a lot of the money that's being spent on, on data is being spent either into the, the JVM, the Hadoop big data ecosystem, or it's still, a lot of it's being spent on enterprise, enterprise data warehousing solutions and databases. Um, so it would be nice to, to funnel some of that money into um, Python-based systems or um, systems that are compatible with, with uh, the Python ecosystem. Um, Something that we're certainly going to have to do is to um, to build to build bridges to these other ecosystems, um, especially especially ones that are um, highly compatible with Python. So I've been, you know, I think Fernando may may talk about it in his keynote, but um, Julia, for example, has built very tight integration. The Julia language has built very tight integration with Python, um, being able to call Python functions from Julia, call Julia functions from from Python, and it's a, I think it's a model of um, sort of a collaboration between languages that uh, I would like to see a lot more of. Another, another aspect is if, if, uh, if an open source ecosystem is going to win, um, we all have to be very engaged in um, finding smart people and getting them to be a part of the community and to help build the community. Um, you can build the community without, uh, without writing the code yourself. That might just be, you know, some people ask me, how can I help Pandas or how can I help IPython or another popular open source project? Um, 
And so the contributions are, are go far beyond the, the code itself. There's, um, there's, there's documentation, there's, um, there's answering people's questions, helping make sure that new people coming into the ecosystem are successful. Um, of course, writing the code is important too. And if you, you know, find a promising um, young person, um, young or old person, who's, uh, might be, who might be a good person to help um, grow the software and to, to contribute to the, to the ecosystem, uh, I think we all need to, even, the, even if we don't build the code ourselves, um, need to help, to help bring those people into the ecosystem and encourage them and help them to succeed. Because um, certainly, um, as, as with you know, most open source software, the, the burden rests on a, a very small number of people to sort of maintain the projects and to keep them going. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of helping sort of, you know, keep that process going and to not have it be the same, you know, sort of handful of people uh, maintaining the projects. Um, so I have, let's see, five minutes left. I'll tell you very briefly what, I, what I'm up to with uh, all of my time back in, back in San Francisco. Um, so we're building a new, um, I, uh, this is not, not really my time for my elevator pitch, but I would call it a, an exploratory analytics environment, um, one that is um, completely visual and does not require, does not require programming. Um, it's intended to solve a mix of both business intelligence and, and analytics problems, uh, and more importantly is, is intended to help with, um, with data collaboration. And so that might be um, so simple as sharing a data set with a colleague, sharing a file with a colleague, um, or it might be you're sharing a project, um, you know, analytics, some form of visualization or pivot table or something that you, you some, value, some interesting thing that you found in the data that you want to, to share and to have a place where you can easily, um, where you can easily do that. So, since I don't have a, don't have a lot of time, but uh, just to give you a little bit of the, uh, an idea of the, um, the type of, type of tool that we're building. If you've ever used a visual analytics tool, this might be, uh, might be familiar, but um, so I have a data set that is um, all of my uh, purchases on, on Amazon.com from the last 10 years. Uh, and so I could do something like uh, select, um, of course it doesn't want to connect because I'm doing a demo. Reload, that solves everything. Uh, Oh, great. So I selected um, state as a, as a dimension, and uh, datapad automatically adds a size metric. So it's the number of rows in the data set for each distinct state in the data set. Um, and so you notice that there's, there's even data from Amazon.com is messy. You've got California here and CA here, which are really just the same thing. And so we can do things like edit those categories, select California, um, rename those both to, to CA, and then go back to the data analysis, and the California group is gone, and it's reevaluated the, the query and made, made a new visualization. Um, of course, I could you know, limit this to the top four groups, and maybe I'm interested in, say, sum of total charge. So this is the total amount of money that I've spent um, for the, you know, most the places where I've sent stuff the most from Amazon. Um, I could do a further breakdown. Suppose I'm interested in looking at um, quartiles of um, quartiles of order size. So I select total charge as a dimension, change change the dimension type to quantile, and set four quantiles. So I get. Um, so if you look at the, the chart now, you see that um, the 75th percentile and up is purchases from $75 and up, and we're looking at total amount charged. And so you can see that the bulk of the total Amazon spending has been, um, has been these large purchases, but you, you can see the relative breakdown between you know, when I lived in Connecticut and when I lived in California. Um, so simple, uh, simple analytics. Of course, I could... Um, drag the dimension to Y and get a stacked bar plot instead, uh, maybe a horizontal bar plot. 
sort of drag the dimension there and get subplots instead of, um, you know, subplots instead of a stacked bar plot. So visual data tool, drag and drop, no coding, um, and uh, built as a, uh, a software as a service tool, uh, which, you know, if you're a small to medium business, um, you know, installing software on, on your uh, own infrastructure, you may not have a, your own infrastructure, so it may be impossible. Um, it's a new model for, uh, um, for building business software. So I don't have enough time to talk about the, uh, the architecture of the system, which I would have liked to do, but, uh, you know, if you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, you know, feel free to talk to me during the conference. And um, thank you very much for, for having me here. It's been a, it's been a pleasure, and, um, and I'm very happy to see a, you know, thriving community over in this part of the world. You know, Python ecosystem is growing, growing like crazy, both in data and, and elsewhere, and uh, I think we have a bright future ahead of us. Thank you. So we, we have several minutes uh, for questions. And actually, our next session will be uh, starting on 40. And we have some refreshment outside. So really, we should only allow several questions. But I know a lot of people want to ask. So yes, please. The purple, the man in purple, yeah, go ahead. You press the button, and uh, you can use the microphone. Uh, thank you for uh, talking. Uh, uh, I have two questions. Uh, first is uh, uh, about uh, your your uh, system. Uh, what kind of uh, database or key value store uh, do you use? Yeah, so we, we've built a, uh, a pretty extensive um, new uh, analytical data store that's doing all of the, uh, the data processing. Um, I don't know what to liken it to, really. There's no, there's no open source projects that, that uh, are a, an exact equivalent. But uh, it's essentially a, similar to an OLAP, like an OLAP system, if you know OLAP systems. But uh, it's, you know, those are the servers that were doing the data processing in question over in California. And so you know, it's uh, Sol's kind of, it's been engineered to be responsive and interactive for, for doing the data exploration. Yeah. Okay. Uh, second question is, uh, what's the difference of uh, Treasure Data? I'm, I'm sorry? Uh, what's the difference of uh, Treasure Data? Uh, treasure Data is uh, oh, treasure data. Japanese comp uh, Japanese company, but uh, who uh, established at uh, Silicon Valley. Yes, uh, I am familiar with, with Treasure Data. I, um, I don't know their product well. Um, we, sh you should, uh, we should talk about it, and I'm curious to know more and uh, know more about their product and you know, how, how we're, we're similar or different. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for your great talk. And um, I'm quite curious about, because uh, you mentioned that you're dealing with R code and like a SQL before, and I'm quite curious would you mind explain more which kind of the most tricky part when you confirm the R code and SQL code that makes you want to build pandas? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an involved question. Um, so with SQL, I, um, some things are very, SQL makes some things very easy and other things a lot more, um, a lot more difficult. Uh, so I found that there were things that I could do in Pandas or in R with five or ten lines of code that might be a hundred lines of SQL. Um, it's just kind of like the nature of like, you know, just the, the you know, the languages are just so different. Um, with R, I, I, it was a compl uh, there was a lot of things, so I, I didn't, I, I found, I had productivity problems, just, just like the, to the developer tooling, um, at least in 2007, um, R was, difficult language to build software in. It's, it's a lot better now, but um, so I found like just building, you know, thousands of lines of code and having, you know, reusable software in R, I found to be uh, a bit of a challenge. And I also got bitten by deep uh, either implementation or design problems in the R based libraries. So, um, you know, you would merge data frames and if you hadn't set strings as factors false, 
at the start of your script, it might silently produce bad data. And so, it, so I think R systematically broke my trust um, and I didn't feel that I could um, put confidence in like, I don't know, I couldn't, I, didn't, I just, I stopped trusting R and I was like, well, if this happens, then I don't, I have, I have no faith in the rest of this stuff. So I need to, I need to be working so with software that I trust. Uh, Okay, we can take just one, one more, more question. question. Then we'll I will release you to the refreshment the next session. So anyone has the last question? Yes, yeah. please. Oh, thanks for your sharing. I see that in your company, the database uh, is doing like the data analytic uh, things like uh, BI tools and something like that. Uh, I'm wondering is that the BI analysis still have a strong demand in the U.S. or in the worldwide? If what has a, what is, has strong demand? The uh, analysis tool still have a strong demand in U.S. or in the worldwide? Yes. Yeah. I, um, there's yeah, a very very strong strong demand for for business intelligence tools, and uh, the market is uh, continues to grow uh, at a at a faster at a faster and faster rate. Um, in particular, um, medium, smaller companies, you know, 200 employees, 50 employees, um, many of those companies have not yet adopted um, business intelligence tools because um, the implementation time or the cost is prohibitive. And uh, so, you know, there's like a, you know, there's, so there's many companies that would benefit from, from business intelligence, um, but they, do, they, they haven't adopted the tools because you know, of, well, any number of reasons. Um, so I think there's, there's a big opportunity right now to, to make the tools a lot more, to make them in a, less expensive and a lot more accessible and a lot more collaborative. Um, many of them are desktop applications. They have to run on Windows. Uh, it's, uh, you know, they aren't, they, they can't be used on a tablet. So if you have an iPad or a, uh, you know, you want to be able to sort of work with your data wherever you are. Um, Okay, so let us thanks again to West McKinney and his great talk. Yeah. Thank you.